podcasting from the backroom studios in Highland Park. This is Not So Kosher with your hosts, Bexy and Bobby. On the program tonight, we have author Christopher Knoxon. He'll be appearing at the JCC Thursday, January 21st as part of the Twin Cities Jewish Humor Fest. Now, speaking of humor, my partner, the potty mouth, Bexy, everybody. Cello, cello, cello. Is that the clapping I hear back there? I have the clap. There are, oh, do you? I'm so Can't talk sorry. About it. It's clappy, clappy. Personal. Oh, God. Do, if, I, if, you, if I clap on you, then do you like... Make the lights go on. I was just gonna say that. I knew I could knew. See, we've been around together. Something too long. goes. Something goes limp. Yeah, exactly. Which it's been uh, too too long. How are you? How was your week? I, I'm good. It's good. It's it's been good. It's um, it's uh, it's getting a little warmer, so that's better. Yeah, we're happy with that. And it's getting lighter too. It's getting lighter, and I love that. You it's can see the awesome. light at the end of the tundra. Absolutely. So you need to make sure you check us out at notsokosher.net. Uh, make sure you hit the iTunes button and subscribe to us and tell your friends and hit Spreaker and, 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 and keep playing. And so we can get our numbers up there, but make sure that you're with Backroom Studios. Tell them who we're, who we're brought by tonight. Who are the sponsors? Oh, the spot. You want to get into that already. Okay. But don't forget about at not so kosher. Tweet us, tweet us, tweet us, Facebook, share, like us, everything. Um, we have an advertiser today. The advertiser. It's like an the appetizer. An appetizer. The app. An appetizer. We have our sponsor is Lycum Paper. Lycum Paper. It has the best paper in all the land. There is not a printer out there that likes any paper better than Lycum Paper. No paper bowl holds food better than Lycum Paper. Stock up today at your local Target. Thank you, Lycum Paper. We appreciate it. We appreciate everybody listening in to us. Not so kosher. Happy to be here. Yeah, super happy. And we have some magical mints for drinks today. You know, thank God for that. I know. After a tough day. I know. So I took a little uh, caramel and I melted it. Yum. Yeah. And I poured it into uh, a Pour little. Pour some caramel on me. Yeah. I poured it that into. Yeah, but that's okay. But yeah, I'm not going to do that for you. I poured it into a little um, Bailey's. Ooh. Yeah. And then I put a little um, Hassan pfeffer in there. I'm sorry. Is that part of Laverne and Shirley? <laughs> yeah. And then I stirred it with a, um, one of those rock candy stirrers. Stirrers. Yeah, stirrers. I like that. And then what's the other thing I put in there? Bourbon. Oh, that's a hell of a drink. All right. So let's take a little sip. Okay. Cheers, everybody. Nice. Mm. Do Are you, you going to vomit? Do, do, you, do you get offended when people say caramel instead of caramel because i say shit like that i love to say pecan pie do you i like to say the south yes it's just kind of more interesting what about pillow or pillow or pillow sleeping bag and pillow pillow bring your sleeping bag and pillow to my house (laughs) you hot (laughs) oh yeah i have something for you (laughs) okay so i had lunch with an old friend today tell us about your old it was very nice it was a it was, uh, um, you know, people you don't see in a long time don't really remember much about them and haven't, you know, it's like you remember when you were a kid mm-hmm. and that's what you remember about them. So like she's now a grown woman and she's beautiful, but when she was younger, she was this cute little curly haired girl and she was pretty quiet, which I think she kind of is now pretty much, but, um, oh, that was loud in the ear. Sorry about that. But she is just, I don't know why, do you hear that echo feed in the back? It's like Starkey Labs is yeah, sponsoring us tonight I, it is, hearing but, impaired. You know, we're going to let that go because I'm not really sure So do we get about. to hear a name or oh, sorry. do, do no, want to keep her anonymous? I want to go private on okay. that one because okay. just in case. Can, I don't wanna... can you say it rhymes with? Um, no, rhymes don't do it. Don't do it. Schmeckle. Okay. Oh, you, you met with <laughs> sh- <laughs> Clemeckle? <laughs> I love her. Do you? Flamenco. <laughs> Where's she been? That no, quiet little curly hair. Yeah, there you go. So, um, no, uh, we just had a really nice time, and I had uh, went to I went to um, salute. Salute. I love salute, and they have white anchovies on their Caesar salad, and white anchovies are very hard to get. Do you know that? Yes. So I have to go to Casetas. Mm-hmm. Um, to buy jars of them. Interesting. And unfortunately, I'd sent big daddy last time because he was going there to eat and i said hey pick me up a couple of those jars forgetting that they're almost 12 dollars for a jar that's wow. you know, 
I'm showing Bobby about a jar that's maybe about it's about the size two of something you're tall. showing me. Yeah. Yeah, it's about the size, the That's length of sure. my index finger. Okay. And it's like 12 bucks. That's a lot. But they are unbelievable. And I make them last quite a long time. I eat them slowly and slurp them. And Very they're nice. They're so good. And love I cassettas, by the way. Love cassettas. Um, so anyways, that was that was fun. And then... Um, so you, so, are you saying you reconnected with her? Yeah, we reconnected and we just had a, it was, it was very nice. We weren't really close friends, mm-hmm. but we just kind of, you know, seen each other more around. Was and, the conversation, uh, did, did it flow? Did, was it somewhat like, yeah, there was no, it was fine. It was good. Yeah. I know what you mean, but no, it, it was good because I wanted to hear more about her. So, you know, mm-hmm. me, I don't stop asking fucking right. questions. So it was fine. Cool. Yeah. So anyways, and then, um, this morning I had a, a, Tell me if I'm using the word properly. It was a revelation. I woke up late. Revelation or, yeah, revelation. Sure. Is Use that, it in a sentence, please. It was a and revelation. The word is revelation. <laughs> it was a revelation that you, I woke up at eight o'clock this morning. Not exactly, but. No. <laughs> <laughs> Help me. Come on. You're Today's my friend. This show Help is sponsored by the word revelation. Revel- <laughs> You, you could have had an epiphany this morning when you woke no, up. No, it wasn't an epiphany because okay. it wasn't like something you, like, oh my God. It was like, okay. wow, I always get up at like 4.35, 5.30. Like clockwork. Yeah, like clockwork. And I oddly f- slept till eight and it was like glorifying. That's like interesting. Like it was really nice. And I felt like a little princess to wake up and the other side of my bed was cold at that point, but sure. that's all right. So it was really nice. I really felt refreshed. 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 <laughs> like a... Spring morning. Like a What's summer's that? eve. Like a summer's eve. That's what I'm trying to think of. But, you know. Summer's what? eve. Like being on my bidet. Not so kosher. Sponsored by summer's eve. eve. <laughs> we so, get them. that's funny. And and then I saw today. Sorry. I just. This is funny. I saw um, uh, there's a situation of overdose. People are overdosing their kids with cough medicine. You're kidding. Well, you know, I don't know if you know that like there are. You know how they used to use like, like they'd schnocker up the kids like oh, when we were for, little. Yeah. They'd give us like some uh, yes. Bur- what did they give you? Brandy. It, yeah, brandy. Give it you, was not, awful. Actually, it wasn't. I don't know if you got it, but I didn't get that. I my mm-hmm. mom used cough syrup or whatever. Yeah. But before, like right before our generation, they would like in the fifties they totally used brandy and yeah. before that. Mm-hmm. So, um, th- you know, I we know that that they got that kind of shit that's in the that's like the robitussin, cough medicine. for yeah, sure yeah yeah like so supposedly people are overdosing yes. their kids mm-hmm. because they're giving them too much right and then there's some recall on the stuff because they listed it improperly of you're supposed to give them this much and someone's giving so them too much yeah. yeah so they're getting overdosed by it so it's kind of sad so i'm sorry do, no do so you i was have just, anything i was just want? i was just trying to like envision lap dances at school with these kids like kids going that were you know what Overdosed I mean? Overdosed on Robitussin cop. shot in the locker room. Oh, oh. <laughs> now sit do... on my face. Exactly. Or sit on my Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So... You always like, sorry, you always like to fill it in with that I one. do, right? You do. I, I do. know. You can't sorry. help yourself. It's sorry. okay. It's all good. So we were lucky to have a little Skype session with um, Christopher Noxon. Um, he is, he was great. He, he was funny and he listened. He let us like say things that sure. we just you know, are so clean and straight laced. Mm-hmm. Um, so Christopher Noxon is an author. He's a journalist and an illustrator. He's the author of a novel plus one and juvenile, which we loved to listen to him about. His book was featured in wall street journal, USA today, the New York times, CNN's in the money. He's written for the New Yorker details, the New York times magazine, Los Angeles magazine and salon. We were very lucky to have him. Why don't you listen in to our interview with him and then we played a little game with him on the program tonight we have author christopher noxon he'll be appearing at the jcc thursday january 21st as part of the twin cities jewish humor fest so you started your career in newspaper as an editor correct correct i lived back east i was uh i I went to school in montreal and then i lived in toronto and then i lived in uh cape cod and then i went to europe and then i came back to la so but i started as a newspaper man and um, worked in newspapers and then went freelance and did a little bit of nonprofit work, um, wrote speeches for Michael Milken for a little while, and then was a full-time journalist, wrote for all kinds of magazines and newspapers, and and then wrote a nonfiction book called Rejuvenile, which was about what it means to be an adult. Yeah. 
kickball, cartoons, cupcakes, and the reinvention of the American grown-up. And it was uh, it, just sort of was it when you had kids that you felt this need to do? Is that what pushed that along? Because you realized you were doing all these things you did as a kid. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was part of it. Certainly, spending a lot of time with children and realizing that I was having so much fun, like watching SpongeBob cartoons. And, you know, I met Genji <laughs> playing kickball, so it was clearly yeah. I was a goof so still from a child. the beginning. Yeah, Bobby and I, and I needed, a, that. <laughs> I needed a fancy sort of New York Times ready name to call myself. So that's where Rejuvenile came from. I, I, I gotta, heard, I gotta tell you, you're kind of my hero because I kind of felt like you wrote that for me because I was on three different kickball teams. Wow! And I was a strong, oh, and I lobbied to have kickball as an Olympic sport because <laughs> I fell in love with it. I mean, seriously, who does that? And I was 35. Seriously. <laughs> And it's for, great. I still I still stand by it, although I haven't played in a long time. But it's a really fun it's a really fun game because it's a great leveler. You don't, nobody is that good at kickball, and I, no one is that shitty at kickball. You know what I mean? It's it, everybody meets somewhere in the middle. I feel like it made me a better athlete because I used to play softball and I sucked at it. But kickball kind of felt like I was good at it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like you were yeah. equal. Like it's an although eight it's inch funny, ball. I mean, yeah. I loved the game, and I, I started playing because I thought, oh, wow, this would be so much fun to, to reclaim as an adult. But the, the league or the game that I was playing in, which was a Sunday afternoon sort of pickup game with dogs, and everybody had a hangover. And <laughs> what I didn't realize is that what it really was was a pickup spot. Everybody was hooking up. Wow. <laughs> For and sure. I was there to play kickball. I was serious. <laughs> it's like, right? What are you guys doing over there? Get out from under the bench. Let's yeah, play, man. I was, well, I mean, out of that game, I think there are three or four families. That's so crazy. Oh, that's people's nice. People's lights were on, and they were that's cool finding each other. W- were you <laughs> were you guys sponsored by like a an establishment, or was it this just was, this was pre Waka baby? I this was pre okay. I love Waka. Yeah, this was before Waka. Okay. And when I wrote the game, when I wrote the book, I I got very interested and in, obviously um, interviewed a lot of the Waka people. And when the book came out, I was asked to go and throw out the first ball at the kickball championship in oh, Orlando, that's Florida. that's crazy cool. Wow. It was crazy cool until I got down there and I quickly realized that no one who actually plays organized kickball wants to read a book. <laughs> so when oh. I was sitting in my little, my little booth trying to sell my, my books and everybody was just wandering past me giving me the stink eye, it was See, a sad. He should have been taking his pants off or his shirt off and at least people would have come over there. That's yeah, or selling, yeah. or selling beer would have been better. <laughs> oh, there you go. I moved from Minneapolis to San Diego, and one of the very first things I did was get hooked up with Waka, for sure. Because I thought, how can I make sure that I'm as comfortable as could be in a new you know, surrounding? I thought for sure that was going to be the hookup. Then people looked at me and said, dude, are you here to pick up your kids? <laughs> and that was yeah. for me, that was the sign that I'm not back home anymore. Do you, Are yeah. you still playing, Christopher? You guys no, still playing? No, I haven't. I haven't played in a really long time. I, it's kind of sad. Is it because you're too I grew busy? Up, I guess. Sad. Oh, I, you, oh. We have three kids, and and uh, I, I end up just driving them to their sporting events. Yeah. Uh, do yeah. they play kickball? <laughs> no. I mean, they play oh. on the schoolyard. And I, yeah, like, I yeah. drop my son Oscar off at, at elementary school, and and I run out onto the, the playground and and play a lot of Foursquare. Oh well, that's so cool. I, I still get my my fill of the red playground ball which is i think the key element. that's a very good thing yeah. um do you can you explain to me toyfication yeah i mean that was a sort of um it's, it's a component of the book which is the idea that uh consumer goods and technology have taken on the uh the qualities of toys in order to appeal to a rejuvenile mindset um the the premise of that is that, you know, everything from like VW bugs to kitchen appliances yeah. have been redesigned in a way to sort of appeal to your kind of inner romper room. Ooh, um, yeah. And you, you see it in design all over the place. Um, after the book came out, I, I got kind of busy with consulting with businesses about how to kind of reach what I was calling the rejuvenile psychographic. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I laugh about it now because it's, uh, I mean, in some ways it was just a total, um, uh, it was a boondoggle. Um, it was a way to sort of extend the life of the book and to get paid by yeah. um, continuing to talk to goofy adults. Um, but I do think it, it's grounded in a genuine human condition, which is that uh, grown-ups my age and 
uh, older and even younger, but at this time don't want to give up the things that they've always really loved. And they've brought a lot of that kind of childlike uh, spirit into mature realms that have never really had that um, that that influence before. Yeah. So you get things like, um, you know, spatulas with little rubber duckies at the end. And um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of, I mean, you know, you look at the dashboard of a car now, and yeah. it's like designed to look like the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Whereas before, or even, you know, even cell phones. I remember when yeah, cell phones came cell out, phones. they were these ideas that they were like tools of responsibility. And now, of course, everybody realizes they're just yeah. big toys. It's true. What color do you want to pick? Do you yeah. want a 24 karat gold one or what? For us adults, right? right? Um, yeah. Do you do you guys hit Disney a lot? Do or is... we, I don't go to Disneyland that much. It's kind of it's crazy there. It's so many fucking people and yeah. the yeah. lines and the insanity. And I, I I don't know. At a certain point, I sort of got over it. Did you? What's going on yeah. with you, Christopher? We're gonna have to. That's not good. I don't know. <laughs> you know, your kids. I, you should tell them they need to bring you back in. <laughs> Something's Maybe I don't know. I, like my kids are a little older, and yeah. I got I got I wrote this novel, which is about um, men and women, and I got very interested in gender, and uh, I recently converted to Judaism, so now I'm really interested in Judaism. So I sort of feel like I've moved on from the the question of age norms, right? Like what's appropriate for what ages. Yeah. I love how you describe yourself as the unchosen, or could you tell us a little more about that? It just cracks me up. It's funny, and talk about the conversion, if you will. Oof. Um, well, I've been playing in the in the Jewish world for a long time. My my wife is Jewish. My kids. One one of the deals that we had when they when we got married was that we would raise them Jewishly, and that felt even though I didn't want to convert, I took the conversion class, um, and I realized it really wasn't for me at that time. Hmm. It sort of felt like I was at uh, at court mandated driver's ed, Oy. except you were learning prayers and holidays, and I was like, this is boring. Why? not answering anything that I really have about the big questions. Wow. Um, but as the kids grew up, I be- our lives became more and more Jewish, and I got involved in a group called Reboot, which does a lot of thinking about what, uh, what, what, if anything, can be done with Jewish heritage. And I found I like talking about Jewish identity a lot more than my wife who's Jewish oh, is. interesting. Okay. And I got very interested in the idea of not being Jewish but doing Jewish. Yeah. Um, sort of trying to unearth the kind of uh, deep intentions of practice and living those out. And so we were sort of unplugging on Fridays and going to temple. And I got, I founded something called the Eastside Jews, which is a non-denominational, like upstart, not unaffiliated, creative ritual making group with Jill Soloway, who does Transparent and some other sort of creative East Side LA people who wanted to have a Jewish life but didn't want to go to a shul and get the get the approval of a of a terrible boring rabbi to do it. Yeah. Um, so you so yes. Yeah. So all that all at the same time, I really didn't want to. Uh, one of the one of the requirements. There are three requirements of conversion. I don't know if you know this. You know, you have to... Uh, we haven't gone through it. We are actually born this way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so explain it to us for sure. It's fascinating. Um, the three major requirements, and this is, you know, uh, Reform, Orthodox, Reconstructionist, they all have this basic uh, requirement. And, and the mikvah is one of them. you gotta, you got to dunk. Yeah. Uh, you have to be approved by a bet deen, which is this panel of rabbis. Hmm. Usually it's three. And for men, it's circumcision. Now, that applies to... Even men who have been circumcised and what? Uh, really? I not that you asked, but I'm taken care of in that wow. department. Well, wouldn't that be they, double? Wouldn't that be double yep. jeopardy if you already had that sort of? Exactly right. No, there's no double jeopardy. They still want your blood. Unbelievable. Wow. And I thought that Jews. was crazy. I, I cut my crazy. wrist instead. Take some yeah. from my wrist. No, they want it from the member. Wow. They have very specific <laughs> from the member. Members, members yeah. only. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So that it. really held me up for a long time. I was like, at any club that makes that a part of the initiation rate, I do not want to be a part of. Interesting. So as part of our show, Not So Kosher, Beck and I open our weekly show with a, uh, a bit called Kvetch and Cavell. Are you familiar with those words? Yes, of course. So is there anything you would like to Cavell about for your, you know, this is your first time on our show? What's what's happening in your world? Talk about some Kvetching, some Cavelling for our listeners. Oh, what do I want to Cavell about? 
I would love to cavell. I, you know, I love my kids. Got I've kids, got three kids. crazy, beautiful kids. Is that that's so horrible and corny? For no, it's no. actually very nice. It's the first thing I thought of actually when he asked but, that question. You know, I've got a I've got a 16 year old who is a high school uh, junior and recently took the SATs and just got his driver's permit and. and he just went on his first date, and, oh. you know, we live in the same neighborhood that I lived in when I was a kid, and I'm just sort of reliving a lot of the stuff that I did as a it's teenager. It's really cool. Yes. It's really and he's nice. just delicious and smart and oh. funny and weird and, and awkward and amazing, and I just adore him. And then I have this uh, 14-year-old girl who's a ukulele player and a singer and a drama person and a debater and... She's lively and hilarious and funny and weird and uh, totally different from my eldest son. And then I have a little jock kid named Oscar who's a baseball <laughs> uh, fanatic. And I was a baseball kid when I was little, and so that's been really fun. I'm carting him around. He's on two different teams, and wow. he knows. I think I don't know that he's going to be a pro player, but he may actually be a GM someday because he knows all the trades <laughs> and he sits around watching Sports Center all day, and it's you know with his hand on his dick. It's really weird. It's, it's just like, we've got a normal kid in this house of freaks. Um, I love it. So I cavell over my kids all the time. That's and perfect. It, and it's so nice to go to those games and watch them. I'm sure you love that. And yeah. watch and listen to the ukulele. And <laughs> I would imagine, like growing up, your kids growing up, they had to realize at some point their parents weren't quite like the Johnsons, right? <laughs> like when did they start getting it and you know realizing? Both parents are sort of geniuses. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I do. I, I, I think that you, you as a kid, think that everything that's in your life is fairly normal. Mm -hmm. You know, my daughter who plays the ukulele, we went camping a couple of years ago and she went off into the woods and, and wrote a song and then played it for all the other people that were on the camping trip. Oh, nice. And, you know, we hang out with a lot of friends who are in show business and do, do media stuff and co comedians and, and musicians and stuff. And so one of the women that was there was like, oh, my God, that was fantastic. Can you open for me at my next show? Oh, that's great. At oh, UCB. So wow. Eliza went and played at, this, at UCB. And then another friend was like, ah, we should get her into the recording studio and put that down. So we mm -hmm. went and recorded the song. And then the next thing you know, Genji uses the song on the the first episode of the last season of Orange is the New Black. Oh, wow. And nice. <laughs> the song that this 14-year-old girl crazy. wrote when she went off into the woods is now, like, charting. Or it I did for, okay, like, that's... a millisecond. So, crazy. yeah, and, and I was like, do you have any idea how crazy that is? And is Alexa. she free labor? Or is she yeah, like, totally free labor. <laughs> yeah, God. <laughs> but she doesn't Something's have any idea. She's like, yeah, of course I wrote a song, and of course yeah. it's on a TV show, and of, of course, course it's available on Spotify right now. Like, no, oh, my no. gosh, that is so great. I love but it. What's, but, what, I mean, to, to her credit, when, when – I mean, we, we, I got a couple of calls of people saying, do you, do, would you like to, to, to record a full record? Like, talk to us about that. And I went to her and said, you know, do you want a record deal, honey? <laughs> That's and she amazing. Said, she said, no, I want to do debate. I really not. Oh, my gosh. I love that. Not Good for her. Not interested. Wow. I was like, are you crazy, honey? People wow. work their whole lives to try to get this up. Exactly. Like, and you're like, no. mm, I don't know. I'm sorry. No, I'd rather. Busy. I want to do debate. I want to wow. do debate. That's great. Yeah, there's, a, there's a tournament coming up I'm really excited about. Good. So. That's cool. You know, we talked about Reed Juvenile for a little bit. Can you tell us a little about Plus One? I love that. I read excerpts today, and I was laughing out loud for sure. Oh, nice. Um, it's a novel, but it's based on my experience. Um, I had been, after the last book came out, I um, sort of had a, a little bit of a uh, midlife crisis. I wasn't quite sure what I did anymore. I was spending a lot more time with the kids. I sort of became a much more of a, a householder and a caretaker. And little Genji's show had really taken off. A little postpartum. Yeah. Maybe for you. Um, <laughs> and I, I um, wasn't writing much. I was just sort of like carting the kids around and taking care of the house. And um, I got a little agitated and I got a little like unpredictable. I was doing things like peeling out in the minivan. Oh. <laughs> in the minivan. <laughs> You're super dangerous. I went to like a laser tag birthday party where okay. I like mowed down all the children. Love it. Um, I just these weird outbursts of aggression. And uh, 
And so I basically realized that I had stumbled into my next story, which was about guys learning to kind of come to grips with uh, being householders. Cool. Um, and so I started writing about myself, and then I realized, well, this isn't, I actually don't want to read this story. I don't want to read about myself. Um, and if I didn't want to read about it, I certainly didn't want to write it. So hmm. I invented a alter ego, and I created a, a, a narrative that felt like a, had a much more satisfying. The reality is that our lives are not all that interesting. Um, you know, we're, we're relatively happy, relatively stable, relatively dull. And I knew that any novel that I would want to read would have some real story, some, some real wackiness, some real um, action. <laughs> So kind of in the way that like Genji took the the memoir of Orange is the New Black and turned it into a kind of incredibly rich, soapy story, right. yeah. um, I tried to do the same thing with my life um, and create a narrative that, that would uh, be dynamic and crazy and, and interesting. So that's what the book's about. It's about a, a householding man and a breadwinning woman and trying to figure it all out in Los Angeles. So does she at any point have any veto power on some of it if it's loosely based on your marriage or not at all? She did. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, when I started writing it, I said to her, when I'm done, you read it and anything that feels too close, feels too personal, feels not mm. fictional enough, uh, it will come out. You know, no questions asked. We don't have to discuss it. It yeah. will still come out. Um, and she signed off and said, it's, it's great. Go with God. It's fantastic. Oh, that's so cool. Um, that's... As we got closer to publication, she got really worried. <laughs> oh, funny. Wow. Yeah, there was a little bit. I mean, there was some concern that people, even though it is very fictional and nothing really in the book happened in real life as it's described, mm -hmm. um, she worries that people who read it will assume that it's all true and that, yeah. Um, even yeah. though I'm saying it's fiction, people will say, "Oh, well, he had an affair, and she's a real cunt." Sometimes, you know, like yeah. <laughs> these are these are flawed characters who are flawed in some of the ways that Genji and I are flawed, and some ways that we're not. And she just thought people will think it's an expose, and Interesting. Um, you know that's valid. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I sort of feel like, well, then you know, I then who cares? Um, I, I all I can say is it's it's. It, I hope it feels true. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. When people read it, I hope that they think that I'm really telling all the truth. And there are elements that are true, but I, I swear to God, most of it's made up. We'll have to remember that because that's my <laughs> next read. <laughs> so I had, a, I had a question follow on, following up on when you have a, a book released, like any musician or band, they go on tour to support the work that they do. Do you hit the road to promote a book? Yeah, I've done. I've spent the last year uh, traveling around a little bit. Um, I've I've been to. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, I I had a, a fairly small press. I had interest from a a, a big publisher, but they um, th that didn't we didn't really come to grips. And so I went with a, a relatively small press that doesn't have a giant promotional budget, so they don't send me out. Okay. So just like musicians who are trying to figure out how to sell their records, you sort of have to figure that out yourself. Right. So, but I've been to St. Louis and Cleveland and Orlando and New York, and um, I'll, I'll go wherever anybody will have me. Is it is it difficult being away from home, or do you enjoy that process and getting out and meeting the people that are reading you, or how does that work for you? It's hard. It's hard. Um, you know, we, we do have help. Um, both our families are here. Um, Genji works like a madwoman, mm -hmm. um, and so it's tough. When I'm, when I'm away, it's a lot harder to, to fill all those gaps, but we make it work, you know, like any family, you just kind of improvise. Um, Christopher, so, and, are you, are you writing in any papers or magazines right now? I'm not, I'm teaching a little bit and oh, I'm working okay. on a, I'm working on my next, uh, bookie project, which is a, um, illustrated memoir about the conversion. Oh, um, nice. I'm trying to draw this one and, uh, it's called prick. I love that right. for obvious reasons. <laughs> awesome! Oh my god! So, how awesome. do you find time to do all this when you're? I mean, I only had two kids, and I was a basically a domestic engineer that also worked out of the house. I had a I have a business outside, right in my home. I I could barely get anything else done. How do you with three and you're running them all over the place, which I understand, but how do you do it? And then, yeah, I mean, right? I sort of I feel like I have a, a 
four, a three or four hour window after drop off before the real domestic crunch began. So okay. like I, I just think about like I'm a drop off to pick up writer. I mean, some of my favorite writers are people who who have uh, crazy family lives that they work their writing into, and I feel like that. In some ways, it gives you focus cool. because. If you don't, and I've talked to other writers who are like, you know, who don't have those kind of responsibilities, who it, it's all kind of, uh, they're always on deadline, right? Yeah, I'm yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. I'm only on deadline like for three or four hours a day. So I can beat myself up for those three or four yeah. hours or I can try to write something. Cool, very cool. And the rest of the day, I'm just, you know, looking after everybody else. Hey, we're going to we're gonna air this prior to you uh, coming into town. I just want to kind of plug that. Uh, let people know that you're going to be appearing at the St. Paul JCC. That's going to take place on Thursday, January 21st at 7.30. Uh, coincides with the Twin Cities Jewish Humor Festival. Do you do a lot of this kind of stuff? And, and, what, are yeah. you gonna, and what are you going to talk about when you're here? Um, I am going to talk about uh, the book and about uh, a lot of what we've been talking about here, but in, in more depth and hopefully a little uh, with a little more humor. Um, I have a little dog and pony show that I've, <laughs> that I've been did. taking on the road, you know, and it's, 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 a, it's about, I will tell the full story of the conversion, which is just crazy. I'm sure. Um, I'm and my moil, Dr. Andy, and <laughs> uh, it's just nuts. Um, and then I talk about uh, a lot of the issues that sort of led me to write the book and why I, I think the, the, the question of, Male householding and female breadwinning is one that we really haven't reckoned with uh, as a culture. And I, I think that there are particular challenges for, for men who are in this position. Sure. Um, it's, and men are not doing it very well. <laughs> do you, um, really? I, what do you, when you I have s- not done it very well, and I've kind of stumbled through that. And Why do you I, say that? Hopefully I, hopefully I think s- I have some, some lessons uh, around that. Why do, you, why do you not feel you've done it well? You sound like a fucking woman. I, I sound like a woman. <laughs> yeah. We always think we didn't do it well. Right. Oh, my God. I didn't raise them right. They're fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> or, or I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> Why do you say that? I don't that, know. I, I, look, I think guys, there, there are, and I was raised by feminists. My mom's a lesbian. I, I love women. I'm about as, and, and, and you know, my, my wife is an incredibly powerful, dynamic woman. Um, but in the end, and I wish that it, it could be just as easy as the, the guys take care of the, the family and the home and the woman goes and, and works and everybody's happy. Yeah. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't think it, that has not been the case for me. Um, okay. And I don't think it's the case for most guys. I think guys have to sort of buck up against some really deep evolutionary sludge. <laughs> Interesting. And work that stuff out because well, we don't, I, I'm deeply embarrassed what? that that the um that the burden of responsibility for uh providing for our family doesn't uh fall to me really and, yeah it's really weird and, and see, i know it does i feel that logical. way i feel that way i do you yeah because when i got married i was a breadwinner then slowly yeah. it kind of turned around where he became the breadwinner and since it's probably been 20 years and i i'm in an uncomfortable situation for me see it must just be a human thing for some of us that you know, we just yeah. feel like we, if we're, we're no good because we're not making, we're not bringing enough bacon in, you know, right. I, but you're doing, but you're like writing, we say, you're writing books, you're writing books you're and on like television, you're on CNN, you're on uh, NBC, like you, you're everywhere. I think it's great. And, and you're a great you. role model for all. Well, I'll just talk to you guys. And, I'll just yeah. talk to you guys yeah, every and, once in a while and then I'll feel better. And I have <laughs> to just say is being a, a father who's being the mother, however we want to say that, that is the that is the biggest job you can do, and you know that. that I, I mean, mean I sh- know that intellectually. You're doing great, but, I but think, still. I, I know that yeah. the culture doesn't know that. Yeah, right. I know, I that, know that the world doesn't know that. Yeah, you're right. And when you go out into the world and you talk to people at dinner parties or just, you know, at barbecues or wherever yeah. you talk to sort of people you don't know all that well, and they say, what do you do? Right. Mm-hmm. That question can resonate so deeply. And yeah. when you say, well, I chase after my kids, I... You know, I'm uh, you, as a guy. Oh my gosh, yeah. the, the guys who can stand there proudly and say, "Well, I'm a house husband," or "I'm a stay-at-home dad," um, and be and, okay and, with it, it's, and be okay well, with that. I yeah. just feel an, an immense amount of admiration for them. Um, but I just feel like as a culture, we really need to sure. figure out how to value caretaking. 
Are there, I do find when you like when the kids are younger and you go to playgrounds or you go to games or whatever or, or concerts where you know your wife isn't available to be with you because it's during the day, do you are you pretty much the only daddy? I mean, are there more that no, there are guys, there are guys, good, but it's still, good. it's it's still a minority, obviously. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, but there's, it's increasingly, and especially in LA, like I have friends who are in a similar position whose wives are, mm-hmm. are, you know, out there kicking ass. And, <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it, but I think guys who do it, uh, you know, so much more, they're on their phone. They're very few of them are like, yeah, I'm looking after the family. Most mm. of them are like, I'm a, photographer i'm a like me i'm a i'm an illustrator i'm a producer i'm a podcaster whatever right they they have to have that sort of um identity marker so that they can they can feel okay yeah i get it um and that's you know look i i I feel in a lot of ways like what men are going through and experiencing now is very similar in a lot of ways to what women were reckoning with I think in like I would say like 1978, like the dawn of of first wave of like maybe mid middle of of the big feminist first wave. Yeah, um, really figuring our place out in in home and in career. Yeah, and you know I look back at those. Hi, oh, my, my son has just come over. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Right. Hello. 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 I, I just had my train of thought uh, totally um, screwed with by my 16 year old. That's son. okay. But the idea is that, like, I think we have much to learn from uh, feminists of For the sure. of the, of the 70s who sort of had to figure out what their place was at home and at, in their careers. Uh, aside from having three kids with Genji, have you guys ever talked about another type of collaboration? Have you guys ever thought about working on a project together? We have not. I think. Um, she does, you know, she's a television writer yeah. and hasn't done anything else. I wrote a pilot based on the book that was uh, optioned by ABC and um, got onto the final pile, but was not was not picked up. Sure, which is totally typical. She wrote twelve before they made one, yeah. um, and I wow. didn't expect much else out of it. But but that was my first foray into television, and so and I don't know if I want to play more in that world. Mm-hmm. Um, so unless I did. Uh, she's not going to be doing the kind of work that I do, and I'm not, probably not going to be doing the kind of work that she does. So, yeah. yeah, and I think that's fine. It's fine. We got we we collaborated on our children. There, there you, go. you go. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. I had a I had a pilot idea for you and I to work on. Orange is okay. the, Orange is the new Men in Black. I kind of want to see. If... <laughs> ah, that's funny. Thank you. I'll be here all week. <laughs> <laughs> so, good. so we like to play a game with our guests sometimes if they're willing to play it, and we came up with a really good game for you this this show. Um, we'll see about know, that. Yeah, we'll see about that. So, our game is called Shomer Prison. So it's we're called- gonna Shomer. Shomer Prison. Did you ever see the big Lebowski, Christopher? Of course. Yeah, the Shomer Shabbat, right. Sh- yep. So this is Shomer, Shomer Prison. Prison. <laughs> Got okay. It. So if you could pick any one person to be your cellmate out of these three, which one would it be? Brad Pitt, Harvey Fierstein, or Ronald McDonald? <laughs> Pitt in a cell, 100%. Y- y- right? Pitt. Right? Of course. I, I, mean, I put him in you, for me. You said I was a woman. I mean, what do you expect? <laughs> there you go. Uh, if you could choose any meal at your last, at, as your last on death row, what would it be? Wait, any meal is my last meal? Yes. yes. Oh boy. Um, I would immediately say XLB dumplings, juicy pork dumplings. Oh, wow. nice. Not so kosher, but I get it. <laughs> yeah, I love a, I love a good dumpling. Wow, I love it. If you had a make out with one guy at Shank Point or, you know, if somebody made their toothbrush into a shiv, who would it be and why? Mm, Gosling. Gosling. Easy. <laughs> go, I mean, come go on. girl. I, I hate to be a total cliche, but if you're not gay for Gosling, then you're not a human being. Go girl. <laughs> I love it. If you could choose two visitors in the next six months, who would they be? Two visitors? Yes. Alive or dead? Does it matter? No. Visitors. Um, uh, Heschel, I think we could have a really good conversation. Excellent. I'd love to, to, to break bread with that dude. Excellent choice. Uh, well, I'm right dead. Um, and because I'm feeling so Jewy these days, I'm going to say Herod. 
I have a lot. I, I've got really. I was just in. I was just in Israel, and I got mm. really fascinated by this guy who intersects in all these incredible stories. That's and cool. So yeah, that is. Really I'm, cool. I'm going to go full on Jew and say I like Herod it. and I love that. If you could watch one Netflix show in prison, what would it be? Or is New Black, of course. Oh my oh, God! Like, really? They can't see Yay. it there. Apparently, it's true. <laughs> oh, can they not? Wow, you guys. That would be. Hard. Yeah, that's apparently they, they don't have Netflix in prison. Anymore. Dang. Yeah. Well, Christopher, we are going to let you get back to your family and your dogs and all the beautiful things. And uh-huh. we thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. And we can't wait to see you on January 21st at the JCC. Uh, My and- pleasure. Come on down. I'd love to. Yeah, talk. we'll continue I'll to plug there. your show. We'll plug your show a couple more times for sure. We want to awesome. We want to wish you well, at And for the time that you took with us, we super appreciate it. And say hi to your wife and kids for us. Thank you. And then we'll talk soon, hopefully. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay, honey. Bye-bye. Okay. That was a fabulous interview, wasn't that? Super we did cool so guy. good. Super and cool guy. He was so cool. And I just really liked talking to him. Did you kind of feel like at some point we were like friends? Well, I almost felt that. I did. Let's see if we can, maybe he'll play kickball with us when he comes here. That's fun. Right? Right. Right. Because yeah. that was, key. I loved hearing that he was a kid. You know, there was some um, women, uh, so this person that, that Big Daddy knows, and she was talking about her kickball team. I'm like, excuse me? Like, there's a huge team in Minneapolis that plays, and I said, I want to start next next year. I'll play. You know what? We have, didn't we talk? Did we talk about this? We have. We're gonna do a a not. We should sponsor it with our t-shirts. Take on other people. That's what we're gonna do. We'll take on other podcasters. That's what we're gonna do. And it'll be. I'm gonna set up Podcast Nation. Balls of calling, mass construction. Yeah, or something. Calling Podcast Nation. Yeah, I like we it. want a kickball team. So you we're tweet ballers. us. We're baller. We ball. We ball. Tweet us at Not So Kosher, and we will. Uh, we really, really want to play. He just seems so genuine and like unaffected by the whole Hollywood thing. You guys got to realize. He doesn't want to be wife, affected. His wife's it. a big fucking deal. She is. And what I found interesting, too, is the fact that they're both from there. And that's probably why they're like, or she, he, mm-hmm. you know, is saying, I just don't want to be in that scene, you know? And yes. she, she's I good for her because I know that it's very difficult. I mean, you know, you've been yep. there. It's a hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard to be part of all that. It is. It is. So. Anyways, make sure that you guys check them out at the at the Twin City Humor Festival Thursday, January twenty first at seven thirty. He's yes. at the St. Paul JCC, and he's he has a warm up. He has an opening act, which is also a nice segue into this person we're going to have on the show. You can talk about the great Rabbi. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to have um, Rabbi Sim Glazer is going to be on our show. I think he's coming up next time, the next the next week. Um, because he's going to be part of, he's going to be the warm up, the warm up for Christopher. Um, Christopher. But then he is doing his own show on cool. January thirtieth. What do you know about him? Because I'm really, nothing. nothing. No, I can't wait to talk to him. I'm so excited Me to too. hear about him. I mean, I've you know I've seen him around town and whatever because of, of the temple. But I keep I haven't... wanting to refer to him as Slim Shady Rabbi. But it's Sim. Is yeah, Rabbi you're very Sim? funny, but he's because he's slim. That's want, really funny. It's kind of funny. I saw him at a chiva last night. Oh, well, that's he not so funny. He led the chiva last night okay. for my wonderful cousin, Joyce Hartman. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was, it's my all right. My condolences. So we want to make sure that you don't forget to get your tickets for our show, Not So Kosher, live podcast taping at the St. Paul JCC for the Twin City Jewish Humor Festival, Tuesday, January 26th at 730. We are the biggest thing to hit the podcast scene in the Twin Cities universe. So don't miss us. I kind of gonna... feel like we're kind of a big deal. Well, in your own little fucking world, but we're I mean... a big deal. In my maxi pad, I'm a big deal. <laughs> That's a bloody That's mess. That's it. I'm so... That is a bloody mess. That's a bloody mess. I kind of, <laughs> I kind of, I'm excited. I'm not sure what to anticipate, but we're actually like, we're, we're, It'll people be fun. are coming to see us. And we're going to like have serious participation from the audience. We, we want to be up in your fucking business. For sure. So don't miss it because we're going to be fun. Bring signage. Bring we'll, signage. We'll read your name on yeah, our like, podcast. Yeah, there you go. Like I'm cold. Like did you see right. that one from? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I have a sponsor. I have Cecil's Deli and Restaurant. I know that's shocking to all of you <laughs> in beautiful Highland Park. Cecil's Deli and Restaurant in beautiful Highland Park offering yummy treats for your tummy. Corned beef hash. For a good hangover fix to all things homemade. From their amazing Cecil salads to their mouth-watering Rubens, you won't want to miss a bite. 
Come check them out seven days a week, 99. Find them at 651 South Cleveland, Cecil'sDeli.com. Can you smoke corned beef hash? What uh, will happen? Like if you go to a good concert. Yeah, I don't know what's going to no, happen with that. I'm, I'm just not kind sure. I've always wanted to experiment. It could be kind of interesting. I'll let you know. It could be kind of interesting. So make sure you tweet us at notsokosher.net. Make sure you check out our next show with Rabbi Sim Glazer. Uh, check us out on Facebook. Uh, can't donate to us yet, but you know, we're going to be all Jewy and make you donate to us. Like us, share us, make sure your friends listen to our show through the backroom studios. S T E W D I O S. Remember you spell that properly, right? Cause you'll be confused with some fucking tattoo parlor right. or who knows what else you'll come across. Thanks so much for listening today. Bobby, thanks a, for being here. Have a great time. I did. Be well, my universe. It's carrying leaves that it lured. Can you cry for your mother and your father too? Can you breathe until?